Now, in the opening, you heard me playing a transcription of one of my own solos from a number of years ago. I'll talk about that at the end of this video, but I'm going to start by picking up where I left off in the last one. As I said there, the ability to transcribe, both in speed and accuracy, varies a lot from person to person. I started when I was in university, literally figuring out one or two notes at a time. Now, ironically, in some ways that's harder, just like it's harder to ride a bicycle very slow, which is what you do when you're first learning. Another analogy might be the way you can figure out the meaning of an unfamiliar word when it's used in a sentence. As you acquire musical language, you start to recognize common patterns of notes. For example, here's a few jazz patterns that may sound familiar to you. Of course, there's always this one. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that jazz improvisation is simply stringing together memorized patterns, any more than having a conversation consists of repeating memorized phrases. But just like certain words are used often, the jazz language contains phrases that have found their way into the vocabulary of a lot of musicians. Of course, there are lots of variations on every phrase, but even so, the familiar sound gets your ear into the ballpark much quicker than trying to determine the pitch of individual notes, and the whole process gets faster. Regardless of how long it takes you, you can be sure that every minute you spend transcribing will improve your ear, and you will get faster over time. Now that brings up a piece of advice. You should think about transcribing as something you do for a certain amount of time each day, rather than worrying about how long it takes you to transcribe a solo from beginning to end. When transcription was a daily activity for me, I always had the next solo in mind so that when I finished one, I moved right to the next one without wasting any time. Now, actually, as a broke student, I didn't waste any paper either, so I've got the ends of lots of solos on pages that look like this. Now, I know some people who only transcribe parts of solos, individual licks or phrases that stand out to them. Now, I think maybe at a later stage that's okay, when you've got a grasp on the language and you're looking to expand your ideas. But to me, this is a little bit like aspiring to be a novelist without reading books from beginning to end. You can't just read a few paragraphs here and there. You need to understand how the author tells the complete story, building interest and drawing the reader in to the point that you're compelled to find out how this story ends. Have you ever read a book where you weren't happy with the ending? You feel a bit robbed, almost as if it was a waste of your time to have read it. When you're improvising a solo, you're essentially telling a story. You've got to engage the listener and give her a sense that there's more to the story than just stringing together scales or licks or patterns, and there needs to be a sense of finality towards the end of your solo. Now, I actually find that this is one of the most common weaknesses among students, how to end their solo so that they don't sound abrupt or like they're grinding to a halt. I suppose that's a topic for another video, but when you transcribe complete solos, you get a sense of how various musicians accomplish this. Really, it all comes down to Maria Schneider's definition of good music, which is music that holds your interest. Now, this is as true for an improvised solo as it is for a composition. And since it's likely that the solos you choose to transcribe do hold your interest, transcribing them should give you some insight into why that's so. Now, in terms of which solos to transcribe, students often ask me for suggestions. And if I'm pressed, I'll offer some. But I really believe that searching out solos that inspire you is an important part of the process. The solos you choose are going to shape your own musical language and style, so your first consideration is to look for solos that represent how you'd like to play. As you get into the process, you might decide to delve into an artist who isn't necessarily one of your favorites, but who you recognize to be musically or historically important. For example, after I had transcribed a lot of hard bop solos from the 1950s, I did a bunch of Louis Armstrong and other players from the 30s and 40s to get some insight into the lineage. Now, in the beginning, it's important not to pick solos that are too hard so that you experience success rather than frustration. Chet Baker and Miles Davis are much better starting points than Charlie Parker or Clifford Brown, and their genius is no less. As a matter of fact, I think it's a different kind of genius to play simply and diatonically as Chet often did, and yet still turn out solos that are so musical and satisfying on so many different levels. Simpler solos will also teach you more about melody construction, which is at the heart of jazz improvisation. If you take a Charlie Parker solo and you play it at ballad tempo, you'll hear that it's a great melody. That was his genius, to construct complex lines at fast tempos that were still essentially melodic in their construction. 
Now, you'll discover, if you haven't already, that intensive listening is exhausting. You should stop before your ears get so tired that you're listening to something over and over and over and you still can't get it. If you take a break and you come back to it with fresh ears, it may jump out to you at the first listen. Now, if it doesn't, and you're still banging your head against the wall, then skip that part. It's not productive to drive yourself crazy trying to hear one fast or poorly executed passage. Now, that brings up the question of slowing a solo down to transcribe it. Well, back when I was a student, the only choice was to slow the record speed down by half, which also dropped the pitch an octave. Now, of course, we have the technology to slow things down without changing the pitch, but I'm still not really a fan of doing that. If there's a section or two that you can't get any other way, then okay in the interest of completing the solo. But I think that you're way better off transcribing an easier solo in real time than slowing down a harder one. Remember that what the soloist played was in direct relation to what was going on around her, and you want your ear to hear all of that, just as it sounded to the soloist at the time. If you listen to John Coltrane playing giant steps at half tempo, well, that's not what he would have played at that tempo. You may get the notes, but you're missing out on a lot of other good stuff. Now, I'm gonna give you a couple of little pragmatic pieces of advice for transcribing. Before you start to figure out what the notes are, listen to the solo over and over, many times. The more times, the better. Get it in your head to the point that you can sing it, at least the rhythms, if not the precise pitches. Taking the time to do that will actually make the transcribing go much faster. Now, when you do start to figure out the notes, always work on the last thing, the last note that you hear first. It's a lot easier to figure out a group of notes if you know where they wind up. You could even try transcribing a solo backwards, starting from the end and working to the beginning. That's also a technique I recommend when you're learning an etude. Okay, so now talking about the opening, where I played a transcription of my own solo. You'd think that would be very easy to do. And on one level it is. I mean, I'm listening to vocabulary that I already possess. But it still takes a number of listens to figure out exactly what I played, and then to play it closely in sync with the recording, especially on a ballad when the notes may not be played precisely in time. Also, since the sound is essentially the same, any differences are really obvious. Now, I actually transcribed a whole bunch of my own solos one time with the thought of using them as the basis for a book on improvisation. I never finished the project, in truth, partly because I was bored with transcribing my own solos. I wasn't learning anything new in terms of vocabulary by doing it. But I do think that you can discover things about your own playing by trying to copy yourself. Anyway, this is bringing us into the realm of what I described as the output stage of solo transcription, how you can extract additional benefit from the solos you've already transcribed. Now, that's what we're gonna pick up in the next video in this series.